Welcome to the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast. Over 90% of today's home buyers start their buyer journey online. Here we talk with not only industry experts, but also your fellow home builder marketers to learn how you can succeed in our incredibly competitive digital world. And now, here are your hosts, Greg Bray and Kevin Weitzel. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast. I'm Greg Bray with Blue Tangerine. And I'm Kevin Weitzel with Outhouse. And we are excited today to welcome to the show, Elena Money Garman, the founder and CEO of Garmin Homes. Welcome, Elena. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Well, we really appreciate it. For those who haven't had a chance to, uh, to meet you yet, can you give us that uh, quick introduction? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I am owner of a beautiful little home building company in North Carolina. My husband and I own it together, Garmin Homes. We build uh, about 150 homes a year. We sold 200 last year. We're growing. We started in uh, 2007, which as you know, was perfect timing for starting a home building company in preparation for 2008 when the world got weird the first time. And um, no, we just, we love what we do. We offer a really intense personal experience to our home buyers, but we build on production. So a lot of us came, Jim and I both came from home builder production backgrounds, large national companies. And we wanted to take all the good from those experiences and layer an intensely personal customer experience on top of that and built the whole company through referrals till just about last year. That's the business, Elena. What's the personal, Elena? Give me one factoid oh, sorry. about you that nobody on this podcast knows. That nobody on this podcast something, knows. Something like, do you juggle? Do you, do you shoot bow and arrows in the backyard? I don't know. <laughs> what do you do? I don't. Something a lot of people don't know. Some people do. I am a super nerd. Like, super nerd. Like, for my 42nd birthday, my husband took me to Harry Potter World, <laughs> and I cried. I was so happy. And when I'm depressed, when I get a, a case of the Sunday nights, I watch Harry Potter movies until I'm better. I, I enjoyed Harry Potter world. I mean, we, we came home and we're looking at the receipts. Like, How much butterbeer did we get? I mean, there's, right? there's the frozen one. There's the frost. There's the, what? there's the like five different kinds. Yes, yes. There's like five different kinds. It's like, oh my goodness. Tastes like frozen diabetes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's even ice cream right now, I guess. Yeah. Right? So it was, that's good stuff. I, yeah, yeah, I can understand the emotion. I, I'm can, super nerd. I also can roller skate really well. Backwards, forwards, the whole works. I can jump. Can you do hockey stops? No, I can do like really pretty turns though. Mm -hmm. what, what I do looks like a jump, but it, it's not. It's it's more of it's a just, a, just a pre-fall. <laughs> yeah, it's a pre-fall. So yeah, yeah. There you so go. out of curiosity, you said that both your husband and you both came from uh, production home builders. Is it okay to ask who you, sure. what companies you were with originally? Yeah, I started on site for DR Horton. Oh, okay. And, um, so so Jim, just a small builder. You know. Small, little known. And then I, I worked for Cal Atlantic when it was Stanpac. And then and then eventually became Lenar. So yeah. Right. Teeny, tiny little boutique shops. <laughs> well, what got you interested in home building in the first place? Why why did you decide to start working with them? So this is an interesting story. I, my degrees and my background are in healthcare. I have a pre-med degree and I have a master's in healthcare administration. So naturally I became a home builder, but I went into healthcare consulting and cried every day to and from work, hated it. And that was I, a different kind of cry from the Harry Potter cry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, okay. Just clarifying. Cry. Okay. Yeah. And I quit when I was seven months pregnant with my first child. That's super good time to be unemployed. And I had a mountain of debt from all that school. And I kind of went on this uh, couple month trek of finding people who loved what they did because I wanted to have a job that I loved. I wanted to love what I did. So I didn't feel like work every day. And um, I found the first person to answer me in the affirmative when I asked, do you love your job was someone who worked on site for D.R. Horton. And so I thought I can do that. And so I did. And, um, and I loved it. It was really fun and I could make enough money to pay back all that debt. And I had a flexible enough schedule that I could be with my daughter two days during the week, work on the weekends when my husband could be with her. So it was a nice balance of parenting as well. So how do you go from kind of that, that new home sales? I'm assuming you're more on the, the sales side to actually wanting to kind of run the show and, and, and be a builder yourself. 
I worked for great women at great sales leaders at both of those companies. And when I was ready to move on in my career, I wanted to, I wanted to become a sales manager. That was the next logical step. And my second daughter was pretty young and um, I had entertained maybe interviewing when I was with Stanpak, but I knew it would be like a, a tremendous sacrifice of my motherhood at that point. And my second daughter was really young and I, I wasn't willing to work seven to eight. And, and that's what it really takes. That's the kind of hours that sales managers work. So I got wind of the fact that Jim, Jim and I both worked at Garmin Home or at, I'm sorry, D.O. Horton. And then I got wind of the fact that he had started a home building company and uh, friends had connected us. And I told him I wanted to come and start his sales team. And we still joke that he didn't offer me a job. I offered myself one sales, you know, that's the best skills you can have. And I did, I started his sales team. And in 2010, when uh, we were really just fighting through the recession, we were driving through a neighborhood where another builder had gone bankrupt and we were looking at their, their home sites because we could only afford anything that was on the clearance rack anyway. And so we were looking at these lots to purchase. And I asked him, you know, from a sales perspective, the recession just seemed to me like they weren't putting the right people in control. Like companies weren't putting sales leaders in control at that division president spot. It seemed like you had to come from construction or land or operations if you wanted to be a division president at a home building company. And to me, it see, I was oversimplifying, but it, did, it also seemed like a logical answer of like, why aren't we putting anyone from sales in charge of home building companies? Because isn't the recession, couldn't we solve a certain amount of it just by selling our way out of it? And so we had this discussion about it, about why women weren't at the top of home building companies. And he said, maybe it's because they're not coming from the construction operation side. Maybe it's because a lot of women haven't built a house. And so I said, well, then I want you to teach me how to build a house because I want to earn the, the, the chance to put myself in the ring to run this company someday. And so I built a house and I blogged about it. It's called Build Like a Girl. And it was the turning point in my career of, you know, schooling myself on how to build a home. But it, it started out as me wanting to, kind of cross something off, check something off the list, but it became about so much more, my connection to our trades and my understanding of what home building is really about and that symphony of trades and how you conduct them as a construction superintendent and how we can really enrich the experience by knowing more about the human hands that, that build our homes and, and wanting to infuse that sort of in every part of our brand from that moment forward. So I, I became a division vice president after that, then a, then a division president. And then I became an owner in 2018. Symphony of trades. Yes. I love that. Thank so you. The, so you're basically not saying that they just kind of, are, the homes just erect themselves. You actually have to have a <laughs> flow of, you know, a, a, a slot building, if you will. You do. You do. I, it was the most enriching experience was these personal interactions I would have with our trades. Cause I would, you know, I would show up on the job site and I would, I, at the time I had this like giant white minivan, my kids were really little and, and I would show up on the job site and be like, hi, I'm Elena. I'm the sales manager. Can I frame this house with you? And they were like, you're who? Like, what? And um, it, was, it was wonderful. It was a fish out of water experience. It's, you know, all the experiences that are, that are just the other side of your comfort zone are the most enriching and the most enlightening. And so when I started to get to know our trades, I started to learn so much more about the impact we could have as a home builder and the experience that we could offer our, our home builders. It really was about position marketing. I don't think people knew who we were before that. They knew we were this like crazy startup builder. But then once I started blogging about it every day and giving names to the people who were building our homes, you know, as a salesperson, it's so much more impactful if you're like the concrete crew is coming and Pedro's in charge of them and he does a great job. And, you know, naming people is, is important giving identity to all the people that build your homes is important. So from that, from that leadership journey where you were kind of told you don't have the right experience to lead, right? right. And so you, you went and got it. Now that you've done that, do you agree with that assessment or do you think you could have done, become the leader without going that direction and, and doing the building piece? Just, just wondering. Yeah, no, my, my path was my path. And so other paths could definitely be different. I think the things that made me a great leader, if I can say that, is, is putting myself beyond my comfort zone. And so for me, that was building a home. But for so many other 
people, I, I don't think you have to come from a certain background to lead a home building company. I think it depends on the home building company. And for ours, you know, we are, we are heavily focused on this, on the sales and the experience. And um, we have a, a woman who runs our, who was our regional president, Rebecca McAdoo, who was the vice president of sales for a, a large private builder for many, many years. And um, she's the best leader I've ever met. She's not so, built a house. <laughs> don't, don't speak too highly of her because people will try to steal her. They can go ahead and try. <laughs> they should. She's fantastic. And I wouldn't be a good person if I, if I held her back from her highest and fullest potential, but I like to believe that's with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, Elena, we, we recently talked with Christy Allen, who I believe you're, you're friends with, you know, yes. and, and, and kind of this idea of, of you don't see a lot of women at, in, in the top leadership roles in, in home building. Do you, do you think that's changing? Do you think there, that the women should be in those positions more? What, what are your thoughts there? I do. I, I mean, I, I, I know more women today than I did in 2010 when I originally had that conversation with Jim. And women like Christy are certainly braving their own path and, and doing it in a really genuine and authentic way to who they are as people. And um, Purette is, is doing that as well. And I know there's women here in the Triangle who have done it. Michelle Sims Reader with Terramore. There's a lot of great women in this industry who make space for other women. There's the Women's Housing Leadership Group where we kind of get together and, and are able to, to understand our positions, understand that we're still in uh, a great minority, but trying to make space for as many of, of each other as possible while also making more space for ourselves. And it's getting better, but it, it has a long way to go. Well, I, I think that it's definitely gotten better, especially on the sales and marketing side of things. You know, there's a, a tons of women in, in those regards, but... But yeah. why, what hurdles do you see women having to encounter when they want to enter the trades world? Why, why aren't the trades going out with the shortages the way they are? Why aren't trades going after, you know, women to be framers? They can handle a saw. They can read a schematic. They can measure just like any guy can. I mean, probably better. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. So what, why, why is that? What are the hurdles that are there? Is it just the, 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 ad, the psychological aspect of it's a man's job? What, what is it? Probably there's a lot of that. It's hard to speak to the trades because I don't know that path as well. But I remember being a little girl and no one ever looked at me and said, wow, you're really good at X, Y, Z. You'd, be, you'd make a great home builder. Part of, the, part of the problem is we don't identify jobs for women that are traditionally not held by women. You know, like when I was growing up, no one said, like, you're going to be a great home builder. And still the first question that people ask me when they find out I'm a home builder was, was your dad a home builder? Is your husband a home builder? And up until two years ago, my husband wasn't a home builder because I wasn't married to him. But, <laughs> but it's, it's insulting. If you wouldn't ask a man, you shouldn't yeah. ask a woman. You know, I, I, it, but it happens a lot, that perception. You're still kind of like, you know, I still walk into a room when I was a division president and I was going to land meetings or in a meeting with a developer. One time this developer, we were their number one builder. I'm not going to name them. And I went to a meeting where all the builders were called for like a marketing projection for the year. And I went up and introduced myself and he said, oh, are you the onsite salesperson? And I said, no, I'm the division president of your largest home builder. <laughs> so it's hard. Still kind of like that's 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 what I'm talking about when I say like you have to make space for yourself and then you have to make space for other people, other women, other others. You know, if you're a person of color, it's even more difficult. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really white and male out there. It's getting better, but we have a long way to go. Well, we appreciate your efforts to, to help address some of that, because until until we, we can talk about it openly and honestly, you know, it, it, it really doesn't doesn't change very quickly. For sure. True. Yeah. We have to talk about it early and often. And yeah, I'm constantly telling my daughters, like, you should do this. You could do this. You could, you know, I think it's being purposeful and intentional about the fact that you can do anything you want to do and that you don't have to, for at least at Garment Homes, you don't have to come from those traditional avenues to ascend to a, a leadership role. You just have to be great. So be it known that you just have to be good at something, not have an aspiration to only be a princess. <laughs> exactly. Right. Oof. That princess culture is hard to escape. Oh, it is. It is. 
<clears throat> well, um, Elena, if we could change tack just a little bit, because one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you today is, is you know, Garmin Homes is known kind of for a more unique customer experience. You know, that's that's something that at I'm least so at least that I've seen, you know, you. Uh, out there. So, <laughs> but but I, I'd like to dive into that a little bit more and, and understand kind of why you chose that direction and some of the things that went into kind of making that happen. Yeah. Well, so when when Jim wanted to start a home building company, he went to the local the the man that was running the Home Builders Association and told him he wanted to start a home building company. And the guy tried to talk him out of it, like, dude, don't do it. And, and he said, well, if you're going to do it, be different. Find out what makes you different. And so we have these four Garmin differences of things that make us different than any other home builder out there. And it's rock stars wanted, which means we hire people with great attitudes and we fire people with bad attitudes, including customers. And that we offer a guaranteed closing date. So we give you a closing date no matter when you sign your contract, if it's dirt in a dream or if it's already being built, everyone has works better with a deadline. And then the warranty, the G team, the way we come back and service your home, you know, you're closing or that when you close on your home, that's the beginning of the relationship of the, of the next chapter of our relationship with you. People still text me and say like from 10 years ago, like, do you have my paint colors? Which is great. I love that. And then give it back for every home that we build, we give back to a cause that we care deeply about. And over the years, we've been able to do some significant things like we've built 10 um, Blitz homes with Habitat for Humanity of Durham. We have built two homes to honor the widows of fallen soldiers through Operation Coming Home. And these are significant ways that we feel like we're living into our dream of being a home building company that can change the world. You know, everyone who comes to work at Garmin Homes believes that or you know that that because that's the bar we're setting we want to change the world and so we do that in small ways and big ways and one of the small ways is just showing up with a great attitude all the time no matter what because it's easy to have a good attitude when everything's going your way and it's much harder when when things are difficult and one of the things I'm I'm so proud of last year in addition to to Hero Home 22 that went to the widow of a fallen soldier was that our home builders association named us the, the home building company of the year 2020 was a ridiculous year. It was hard and it was hard to keep a good head on our shoulders. It was scary. We had, to, you know, I have a tremendous sense of responsibility for keeping everyone in our company safe. And we remained essential. We never got a stop work order here in Raleigh, which was wonderful, but we had to be so careful. And I'm, I'm so proud of our, our company for earning that distinction from our peers and, and for being someone who, who can stay steady and have a good attitude and keep our eyes on, on a long-term plan for our company. Elena, you, you listed four things that, that drove that, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you hold up the card you were reading from when you no. told me those four things, right? Because we, you know, those inside and out, don't you? You, you didn't have yeah, to I mean, think no. about that, right? That yeah. That's just, that's just part of what you guys have. have and, and I love that. I love that, that, that you yeah. have some very clear defining principles that drive every we were the question was about customer experience and we're talking yeah. about all these these four principles i i love that i love that Thank so just you. congratulations i was just teasing about the card she's not reading people you can't see it. she's not <laughs> so in your in your market you actually have several different types of builders you have several different types of buyers yeah what what market are you actually serving because i know you have the fresh paint series mm -hmm. uh, you know how do you how do you delineate and, and differentiate yourself in that regard so Garmin Homes has two brands, two home building brands under one company and Fresh Paint by Garmin Homes is a, a, a brand that we started in 2014 as a way of simplifying the home building process for a millennial buyer. Initial, that was our initial idea. And within a large master plan community, we wanted to be the from the price. That's what I like. That's my sweet spot from the because I want to offer buyers more than they're expecting. I want to leverage all the tricks that I know about production home building and, and, and scale something with, you know, trade-off for repeatability and is the fact that we get really good pricing, right? So I want to get great pricing on my home so I can offer the buyer more. And fresh paint is curated whole home design. So you pick from a package, you don't pick your selections, you know, kind of suit to nuts in a design studio. We, we curate them for you and you pick the package, which means you have finished selections at the time of contract, which allows us to build your home faster, which allows us to use less people to build your homes, less, less construction superintendents, less chance for error because you can't make any 
changes to the packages, a more streamlined approach. So you don't have to take off work to come do your selections. You don't have to um, agonize over the color of grout because by the time you get to grout, people are like on the floor throwing a temper tantrum in the design studio, <laughs> like it's torture. So it's just offering a different, a more simplified home building experience for fresh paint. And we use a lot of paint and quite literally, we're, we're not, you know, our tagline was rage against builder beige because there was so much of the same, you know, it's that sea of sameness, which I call the sea of beigeness, but now it's the sea of grayness of, of using, not being afraid to express ourselves in color. And, and I want our homes to look like they do, like the homes that you see in a magazine. You know, I don't want someone to come out and just not know that they were someplace special or that someone didn't put a lot of thought and energy into trying to offer as much as possible for the least amount as possible as well. Attainability is something I, I take very seriously. So that's Fresh Paint. It was originally millennial targeted, but you know who loves it? Boomers. <laughs> I, I am your so customer. Simple. Number yeah. one, I have, no, I have no fashion sense whatsoever. So you can show me swatches all day long and I couldn't tell you what goes with what. And yeah. I want to just, pull, I don't care how you put the whole menu together. I want to point at the pretty picture and say, that's the steak I want. Right, exactly. And it's, you know, at a certain level at the upper tiers, so as we have curated packages at different levels, it's like concierge level. So it goes from being super attainable to being, well, yeah, we can trick out this house. If you're, you know, there's no ceiling on the price, but yeah, you can go, you can go crazy with it. But so it's been a wild ride with fresh paint and wonderful and Wait, Just, wait, did you say there's no what to the price? There's no ceiling. Ceiling? What? That's a crazy concept. <laughs> so you mean the starting price doesn't ever have a spot where it just stops? Right, exactly. We can't go past this, this price. You this must price. stop. Absolute max. You cannot spend more than this. Right. Unless well, their, you can, but the lender says. <laughs> so, uh, Elena, do you see other builders starting to get into this packaging concept oh, a little bit more? Yeah. I, I, th I think it's long overdue, honestly. I'm a little surprised yeah. more aren't doing it, but what, what are you it's seeing? It's difficult because you have to say no. If you're going to do it right you, and you do a curated whole home package, I have made a covenant with my trades that I will not let people mess with that package in exchange for starting me at level two or three finishes, not level one. I don't want to build a basic house. I want to build a beautiful house. I want you to give me the best price you can. But if you start letting people switch things around, like I don't like that backsplash or I don't like that paint color. And I mean, if we call it a fresh paint. No, it's like that emoji with the cross, <laughs> like a fresh paint. No, is you don't even ask anybody if you can make a change. There are no changes because that's the covenant we made with our trades to get the pricing and be able to offer you more house for less money. But the beauty of what you do is you offer that, but then you also have another pathway for yeah. the Gregs that maybe has much better fashion sense than the Kevins do and could come in and say, you know, right. I know how I want my house. I know exactly what appliances I want. I know what kind of backsplash I want and, you know, and what kind of flooring. Yes. You have that as well, right? Yes. And that's, it used to be called just Garmin, Garmin Homes Path, you know, just the heritage brand. And we've recently, we launched it um, in 2020, nonfiction, which when we first started this home building company, it was about telling our story to the buyer, you know, like, this is why we're different. And this is who we are. And as we matured as a home builder, we realized that the real honor and privilege of getting to build someone's home is telling their story. And so nonfiction became about earning the the chance to tell somebody's story through their home and really making it a reflection of who they are. And nonfiction is about not is about no fake news. Like your your life is your life, and 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 we respect it and honor it. And authenticity and genuineness is prized above above all else. And we want to reflect that in your home and create something truly unique just for you. Now, from a digital standpoint, how are you telling the story of those two pathways that your buyers can take? by virtue of, and maybe I'm asking too broad of a question, but by virtue of how you have established, how you set up your website, and mm -hmm. then also how you uh, market digitally, how you send out, you know, social media campaigns, you know, how do you, how do you speak to both audiences? So we used to have two different websites up until last year, which was, which was a lot of work and, and a lot of, um, we weren't always leveraging the full impact of the brand of, of Garmin Homes. And so Fresh Paint sort of had its own identity. Garmin Homes had its own identity. And we had these back doors from one website to the other and back again, because we build both brands in the same neighborhoods in a lot of cases. So with nonfiction, we merged the websites and kind of, we, we had to fix our identity crisis of like, 
okay, Garmin Homes is the parent. And these are our two brands. This is the Fresh Paint brand and this is the nonfiction brand and they exist together. It's just the experience that the home buyer chooses. And so we have to be very explicit about the fact that the four Garmin differences go with both brands. You don't, there's no trade-off of that, that the heritage, the, the soul of Garmin Homes is in both of them, but they're just two different experiences and allowing the buyer to determine their own path for, for home building, what fits their, their budget and their, their tolerance, their patience, <laughs> their budget, everything, how that, how that works for them is up to them. But yeah, digitally, we have to be, we have to be very explicit about, about which one, which one we're building in which neighborhood. It's kind of fun though. It's a fun little puzzle. <laughs> do you do you find Elena that that with the with the fresh paint with the packaging things that you have ever lost a customer because they weren't able to conform to what you've got? Are you able to shift them over to the other side to keep the customer and and, and just kind of say no, you're you're on you're on the wrong side of the the wall here. Let me put you in this room over here, and then and then we're good. Yeah, we we've, we've definitely shifted people between the brands when it when it's possible. I'm sure we've lost somebody for you know just not just having the fresh paint now and just saying no there's one story this reminds me of when we had a buyer uh, a couple and they the, they really didn't love the the accent wall color that came with their package their fresh paint package and they hated it and they didn't want it they said just don't paint it and I said we can't it has to be painted the accent wall color like I've negotiated with the painters they're coming to paint it I'm not going to change it you know so we we got through it but at the end of on the closing day, the the, hus- the mail buyer called the sales agent and said, I'm going to propose to my girlfriend when we get to the house. And so he wrote, since he was going to repaint the wall anyway, he wrote, will you marry me on the wall? And the sales agent was hiding to like capture it for him. So it was funny, this, this like, you know, this, this impasse that we had turned into this really beautiful moment that we got to be part of. So, I mean, that's, what's important, building the relationship to sustain the ups and downs of the home building journey and, but sticking to, to our guns and, and and making sure that the, the brand delivers the promise. I, I think, I I don't know. I'm fascinated by this ability you have to tell your customers no, and they still like you. This is, this is good. This is great. Um, You know, and I think we're so scared. We're so scared to say no when it's not in their best interest. We you used know? to think good customer service was saying yes all the time. And the parallel I draw is if I let my kids eat all the sugar they wanted when they were kids, they'd feel like crap. If I said yes all the time, I'd be a terrible parent. And so for me to be a good home builder, I have to be the expert. I have to love as much with tough love as I do with the, the yeses. It's when you say no, you're preserving the quality of the experience that you, you're there to offer. And so that we had to grow into that because we said yes a lot and we shouldn't have, and we, we ruined the experience. It was our own fault. I, I absolutely love that. I think, I think that applies uh, to our company. We need to do a better job of that too, you know, guiding people and, and being, being the expert, not that we're not, but you know, there's always room for improvement. So thank you. Yeah. I learned something today. So oh, appreciate that. <laughs> so Elena, I want to be mindful of your time today. Um, and we really appreciate it. So, but as we kind of, you know, wrap up uh, as we, as looking ahead, what are, what are some of the things you're seeing change with your buyers over the last year or so that, that you think are going to become kind of the new trends going forward? Any, anything come to mind that, that you've been watching and looking at? Yeah, this is a great question. So we, this past year, we've been part of the America at Home study. Terry Slavik Suki and Nancy Keenan and Belinda Swar did a study in the third week of April when we were all at home um, during the height of the quarantine of 3,000 households about how are they were using space during quarantine and how this changes how they use space moving forward. And they they reached out to me, Terry reached out to me and asked me if I would build a concept home based on the data that they gathered. And we said, absolutely, we will build the concept home based on this data because I don't get to build for 3000 people, but I get to leverage the knowledge of 3000 people and their responses. And then the second wave, which was, you know, now we're up to 5000 people. They, there was a second wave of the study in October. And all those responses add up to a concept home that we're building in Chatham Park in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, and that we'll be beginning here in the spring as soon as we get the lot. And, um, you know, spaces have changed for us and they need to keep changing. I mean, I've changed two rooms in my house to make a 
you know, last year it was an elementary school, a middle school and a high school. I had a room for each of them. This year it's a high school room and an elementary school room. And, you know, I'm constantly re redoing my spaces to reflect what I need. And I think as we're building homes, we're trying to include a hefty amount of flexibility to reflect what the buyer needs. Is someone going to work on the front line? Do they need to, you know, shower immediately upon re-entry to the home? And does that need to live right off the garage now? Does there need to be a bathroom right there so that people can sort of decontaminate before they go into the shared space of the home? So we're really exploring how the home needs to meet someone where they are in their lives. So if you're doing, you know, we're doing life from home right now. We're, we're doing school, playtime, all of these different adaptations we've made to our spaces. And, and certainly people need workspaces because a lot of people are going to continue to work from home, but, you know, they don't want to take up a whole bedroom. So it's how are we mining the floor plans for thoughtful spaces that were always there, but we weren't arranging the space to maximize it. Is that, is that a report that's out there that others can see? The yeah, results of the, the America at Home study. Yeah, they okay. can go check it out. And then we will, we will start that building here. And I get to build it, which I'm super excited about. I haven't built a home in a, quite a long time. So yeah, I'll be running construction on that with my husband and another, another builder who will make sure I don't mess up his neighborhood. <laughs> Are you, are you going to be blogging that one too, like you did before? We are. Okay. Yeah, I am right. going to blog about it. I think we're going to do a lot more on video though, because I, I certainly like to write still. I love writing and I love speaking, but sometimes it's easier to catch, catch it in real time on YouTube or wherever. My husband's good at the, the film editing. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll we'll have to uh, we'll have to have you back uh, next year after that's done. See how, uh, that'd be see wonderful. how it goes. So, Thank you. So. I love that. So, uh, Elena, is there any last uh, little pieces of advice or anything that you'd like to, to you know, you got some, some home builder marketers listening out there, you know, your chance yeah. to, to, to dump on them however you want to, you know, what, give, us, give us your best shot here. What do you got for us? They have enough dumps on them. I don't <laughs> have anything on them. I need to applaud them for their efforts to, to reflect the, whoever, you know, reflect the stories that, that they want to tell of their home builder. I think home builders are doing a fantastic job of trying to honor where people are right now and, and how they're navigating their lives and, and, and reflecting that thoughtfully is a really hard job. And I think there are some, some, some really beautiful marketing efforts out there in our industry. And I, I love the stories we're getting to tell and, and representation matters and tell, tell the stories of the others. You know, we need to broaden our, our term of, of who contributes to this industry at the highest level. It's, it's who we hire. It's who we feature in our ads. It's, it's the home buyer stories that we choose to tell. So go to the edge on that. <laughs> Terrific. So everybody makes mistakes. Everybody yeah. does. So out of your entire pathway through the home building industry, you got little Susie. Little Susie wants to go in the home building industry. What advice do you give to little Susie just fresh out of high school, wanting to jump in here, both feet on the ground? you know, boots on the ground, if you will, not, not yeah. princess glass slippers. Yeah. Um, what advice do you give that to give, give to little Susie? Oh, have faith in yourself, Put your, you know, you, you're going to walk into a lot of rooms where people don't look like you, or you'll be the only woman, or, you know, you'll be the youngest, or you'll be different in some way, racially, or your sexual orientation. And, you know, keep your head high and your shoulders back and know that, you know, you were born for whatever's in front of you and keep going. If you, if you want to do this, it won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Just keep going. I love that. Thank okay. you so much, Elena. If, if yeah. any of our listeners would like to uh, connect with you, what's the, what's the best way for them to get in contact? Not Facebook, <laughs> uh, Instagram at Elena money, Garmin, LinkedIn, unless you want to sell something to the business, which I don't run the day to day. So I can't hire you either, um, but you can say hi. <laughs> I'd love that. Or you can email me, Elena at GarmanHomes.com. Terrific. Well, thank you again, Elena, so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for listening to the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast. I'm Greg Bray with Blue Tangerine. And I'm Kevin Weitz with Outhouse. Thank you. Thank you for listening. To learn more about how Blue Tangerine and Outhouse can help you generate more qualified home buyer leads, visit bluetangerine.com and outhouse.net. If you've enjoyed our show today, please tell a friend, leave us a review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. 
be sure to join us again on the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast.